Hi everyone, Michael here, Vegan Space Scientist. Today I want to talk about the role that the media plays in shaping the views of the general public. It may not be a surprise to you that the media does not always have the best interests of the public in mind. After all, many media organisations are either for profit or run by governments, and so competing interests like profit, money and political ideology are inevitably going to come into the picture. However, I want to talk about another weakness of the media that I don't think is covered as much, and that is balance as bias. In this video, I'm going to talk about the paper from nearly 20 years ago that initially proposed this term balance as bias. We'll talk about a few examples, and then we'll conclude by talking about Channel 9's 60 Minutes segment last week on conspiracy theories. In particular, I'm going to talk about why I think the airing of that segment actually caused a great deal of harm. I'm going to just read the abstract of this paper because I think it gives a better overview than I could. This paper demonstrates that US prestige press coverage of global warming from 1988 to 2002 has contributed to a significant divergence of popular discourse from scientific discourse. This failed discursive translation results from an accumulation of tactical media responses and practices guided by widely accepted journalistic norms. Through content analysis of US prestige press, meaning the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal, this paper focuses on the norm of balanced reporting and shows that the prestige press's adherence to balance actually lead to biased coverage of both anthropogenic contributions to global warming and resultant action. They also say the continuous juggling act journalists engage in often mitigates against meaningful, accurate, and urgent coverage of the issue of global warming. These press outlets have done this by adhering to the journalistic norm of balanced reporting, offering a countervailing denial discourse, a voluble minority view that argues either that global warming is not scientifically provable or that it is not a serious issue, giving that roughly equal space to air its suppositions. So the paper argues that this occurs due to a combination of intentional and tactical choice by the media through the journalistic norm of trying to be balanced. When the media or a journalist reports on an issue, they often like to try and give both sides of the argument equal weight, whether that's by having an expert from one side and an expert from the other side, or something else. This makes sense in some circumstances, like when we're discussing a particular political ideology or something like that. However, when we're talking about science, it doesn't necessarily make sense. So while this particular paper talks primarily about climate change, I'd argue that this term balances bias could and should be applied to pretty much any scientific reporting in the media. So consider when the media interviews someone on any scientific topic, but particularly one that has been quite politically charged like climate change. They often like to get a scientist, pitch them against someone who holds an alternative interview and have them have a debate or interview them both. However, this just creates the incorrect perception in the public that the issue is actually undecided, when in reality it is not. Now, of course, there will always be some uncertainty. We can't be 100% sure about pretty much anything. Uh, I'm not 100% sure the sun will rise tomorrow. But as I've said many times before in this channel, there comes a point where we need to act like we are pretty sure about something and to stop having uh, doubts in everyday discourse. I think, at the very least, the reality of climate change and its human-caused nature is certainly reached this point. Another related problem is just how often scientific journalist is wrong. So this study from 1984 sent science stories and journalism to scientists to see how many had errors. Quote, 48.5% of the respondents said that the story was entirely accurate, which I guess would imply that the remaining 51.5% is a little bit inaccurate, somewhat inaccurate, very inaccurate, it doesn't really specify. One study of the accuracy of science reporting in newspapers indicated only 29.4% of scientists find the story completely accurate. Another study from 1996 said, this study evaluated the accuracy of newspaper reports on an annual consumer report that reports the expected number of deaths following bypass surgery conducted in Pennsylvania hospitals. Analysis of 42 articles published from the 1994 report identified 52 factual errors, 127 mistakes in technical terms, 29 misspellings of proper names, and 7 misquotations. Now, when looking at these errors, I don't know how much of it is intentional. I will be happy to give the benefit of the doubt and say that very little of it would be intentional. 
I suspect most of it is just the journalist not understanding the science or maybe even being lazy in their reporting. Let me give a more recent example. An article in the Daily Mail from 2017 is titled, If you want grandchildren, make sure you eat protein, study finds. Normally the Daily Mail doesn't surprise me for their subpar quality reporting, but this one was pretty bad. This article originally claimed that a study showed low protein diet in humans led to low fertility. I read the study they cited, and it actually had no data on humans. It was talking about bovines and fruit flies. Further, the Daily Mail article then made the leap to say that, therefore, not eating meat can lead to infertility in humans, something that the original paper didn't actually mention at all. They just kind of made their own assumption. Now, I put in a complaint to the editor of the Daily Mail, and impressively to their credit, they actually went and changed the article. The damage was already done, in a sense, but I would encourage you, if you do see an article with just some blatant, incorrect statement about the actual study, as often happens, then don't just give up. Please do write a letter to the journalist, to the editor, to the management of the newspaper or the publication, and try and get that changed, because you may be surprised this can happen. Okay, let's talk about 60 Minutes. So last Sunday, on the 7th of June, 60 Minutes ran a segment on conspiracy theories. Most of what they were talking about was related to SARS-CoV-2 and coronavirus. They interviewed two people who were putting forward views that are not represented by science, and they interviewed one scientist and one medical professional. That's a ratio of one to one, and that is exactly what I'm talking about. 60 Minutes is trying to appear balanced, and in doing so, they're creating a bias in how we, the public, would perceive the issue. When I decided to make this video earlier this week, I actually had been deliberating a lot about how much to actually talk about the people putting forward these alternative views, and how much to even address the points that they are making. I've decided to talk about specifics as little as possible, because I just don't want to give them a free extra platform, and I won't be showing any footage from the program itself. To explain why, let me talk about something a little bit different. There is a view that reporting on acts of terror like school shootings and bombings actually creates a net harm. By showing the name, the face, and giving airtime to their ideology, you actually encourage future school shooters, future terrorists, because potential terrorists would look at this and they'd think, if I wanted to get my message out there, this is a really effective way to do so. So, what's the solution? At the moment, I favour not reporting the name, face, or any other identity of the shooter, and not reporting their ideology. Instead, I would like to see the media talk about the event that occurred, acknowledge the lives that were lost, and maybe talk about the victims a little bit more. And so for these same reasons, I want to give as little airtime as possible to the ideas and the people presented in the 60 Minute segment. Having said that, I will mention one of them, because there are some things that they said and did that really are quite critical to my point that I'm trying to make here. So in this segment, they interviewed Pete Evans about his views on COVID-19. Pete Evans has also produced a cookbook using a paleo diet for babies. Medical professionals have called this cookbook dangerous because of the low nutrient count in many of the recipes, and also the risk that parents might opt for these recipes instead of for breastfeeding for very young uh, newborns. He also promotes what is basically a fancy light box that is sold for $15,000, which he claims will, among other things, protect against SARS-CoV-2. Now, while Evans didn't produce the product, he didn't develop the product, he's certainly promoting it. I'm just giving these examples to give an impression of some of his other views and why I think they are harmful. So the things that Evan talks about in the interview, whether he is doing it intentionally or not, is largely around sowing doubt. So when he's asked, does he think Bill Gates is behind all this, the coronavirus, he says, I don't know. As if to imply that, well, he doesn't know, but we should act suspicious of him because he, we don't know. Well, I don't know if my neighbour started coronavirus. Should we be suspicious of him? More so than reasonable? No, I don't think so. That's just one example. He talks about science changing over time. We learn new things that were wrong and the models on coronavirus were wrong. Yes, but so what? Models are wrong. And we should always be updating our views, but that doesn't lead us to some of the other conclusions that he seems to be going towards. He also says something like, if I had to live in a society where I can't hug my mum, I assume he's implying that he wouldn't want to live in that society because he didn't finish that sentence. Like, 
really. Let's say it was a particularly deadly strain of avian flu that was 80% likely to kill your mum. Let's say she's in a at-risk category. This is a hypothetical, of course, but there is a possibility of an avian flu in the future being that deadly. Would you still want to hug your mum? I would hope not. It's about risk management. Everything we do has a chance of killing either us or someone else. Whether we think about it or not, we're constantly doing this risk management. I'd argue it's better to think about it rather than to ignore it. But for me as well, when I first got back to Adelaide a few months ago, I didn't visit my grandmother for a few months. And I only recently, as of a few weeks ago, went for the first time. This was hard for her and this was hard for me, but I didn't think the risk was worth it. So it turns out that Pete Evans uploaded his whole 90 minute interview uncut to YouTube on his channel. Uh, and I decided I'd go and look at it because there were some people on Twitter saying that the 60 minutes interview, which of course was much shorter than 90 minutes, his part of the interview was maybe five to 10 minutes. They were saying that it had been cut and edited to make him look crazier than he was. And so, yes, I did go and watch that full interview. Uh, you're welcome. Now, the full interview gives more nuance to his views, lets him expand on some of the points that were just short sound bites in the shorter version. Of course, of course, that's only natural. But I still disagree with most of what he said. In a lot of what he said, there was a tiny bit of truth, but he was either being misleading, whether intentional or not, or just flat out wrong. The content that went into the final cut was of course strategically chosen by 60 Minutes. That's the nature of them cutting and choosing certain things, they're not doing it randomly. But I don't think the way that they did it was particularly misleading or out of context. I will say that the interviewer, Liz Hayes of 60 Minutes, was engaging in a questioning style that I would describe as quite badgering. She was really pressing on some points and trying to make Pete Evans say some things that he clearly didn't want to say. And she was maybe leading him to a conclusion, but Maybe that's just her interviewing style, not that that would necessarily defend it or anything, but I think it's fair to say that she wasn't exactly sympathetic from the start. Now, Evans was actually surprisingly self-aware about this whole thing and some of the things that I was talking about. He said, I have a healthy skepticism about how this might be edited. The funny thing is, when these stories come out about me, it raises awareness. Now, needless to say, none of that particular quote made the final cut, but he's absolutely right. Reporting on all of this just raises awareness about his ideas. It's just the case that Evans thinks this is a good thing, and I think this is a bad thing. And finally, the title of the full version that Evans uploaded to YouTube is actually wrong and misleading. The title is Pete Evans' Unedited and Uncensored Interview with 60 Minutes in Full. But at 25.45 minutes and 54 minutes 53 seconds, there are quite clearly cuts where he's edited it. The first seemed substantive, as in there was an answer to a question that was just simply removed. The second cut looks a little bit more maybe like the cuts that I make in my videos, just for the sake of shortening, like ums and other blank spaces in between content. And I won't count the cuts at 1 hour 13 minutes 18 seconds and 1 hour 15 minutes 18 seconds, because that seems to be after when the main interview ends and they're just cutting because they're going back to some extra questions that uh, the interviewer thought she had missed. Now some of these may actually be reasonable cuts and edits to be making. Mainly I'm taking the issue with the misleading title that he has put forward. Now, look, 60 Minutes know what they're doing. They're creating a controversy so that people will watch the segment and debate it, talk about it, and they were very good at that. Why, here I am talking about this, I just watched the 60 Minutes segment twice, I watched the, the full interview. It's the same reason why 60 Minutes let a radio host a few weeks ago play a prank on his co-host pretending he had some kind of terminal illness and was going to die. And in the end, it was all just for content. They're quite clearly engaging in these kind of stunts and controversy for, for views, for money. Maybe there was a time when 60 Minutes was a respectable news program, but it's quite clear that today they're just engaging in a lot of different stunts like this to just produce more views and money. So please don't watch the program yourself. Unless you're trying to fact check something that I've said here, I think you're only going to be a, giving them views and money through advertising, but also, maybe more importantly, you're just going to be showing them that their strategy is working and that they're going to just keep doing more of this con controversial content to get more views. The best way we can fight against this is to not respect them and to not watch the program. I've tried as hard as possible with this video to not promote the ideas that Evans was putting forward. I think a little bit of mention of them was necessary for the point that I was trying to make. So what should the media do? 
Interviewing 99 scientists and one person putting forward an alternative view is not very practical, so I, I just argue that they shouldn't interview that one person at all. This may create a fairly reasonable worry, which is, do we want the media to be the arbiters of truth? Because if they're making that decision to not put forward the alternative view, then in a way, maybe it can be perceived as them controlling what we see as the truth. But, in a sense, they're already doing this. By putting forward one person from each side, they are altering and controlling what we see as the truth. By creating a balanced view of an unbalanced issue, they are creating a bias in how we see certain scientific issues. So I want more oversight on how the media report on science. To finish up, I'm going to quote again one of the papers that I quoted earlier. The authors conclude that trade publications appear to have provided the most accurate coverage and recommend development of a voluntary certification program for science reporters and that scientists be encouraged to seek additional training in newspaper relations. It's fair to say that scientists aren't necessarily the best communicators, that is why there are journalists. Not everyone wants to go ahead and read a scientific paper. But whilst media is largely to blame for this, I think also, in a sense, it is maybe a little bit on the scientists to get better at communicating the science, to get better at making sure that the journalist actually understands what they're saying. We can't always control this because sometimes journalists will write about your uh, particular research without consulting you, but this is something that we do play a role in as scientists. So I think I'll leave it there, folks. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Interviewing 99 scientists and one conspiracy... Interviewing 99 scientists and one person putting forward a... Interviewing 99 scientists and one person putting forward an alternative view... Interviewing 99 scientists and one person putting forward an alternative view is not very practical.